Hi and welcome to Boston Media Theory. I'm Marcus Breen and this is a show which has been on hiatus for a while but this is a show where we and I interview and have conversation with people from Boston who are engaged in academic research, consulting, activism, poetry and other issues associated with media communication and whatever might I guess take our fancy. And tonight I'm delighted to welcome Victor Wallace to the show and after a long break for from not being in the studio uh, it's good to have somebody back who is uh, interested in and interesting uh, because of this book especially that uh, is the second edition of Victor's book which we're going to talk about and as you can see uh, the title is pretty clear red green is hard to miss and uh, it's a terrific uh, read and a fascinating set of insights and observations from, if you like, the not only about e eco-socialism but from the perspective of uh, the long traditions of Marxism and uh, left activism. So welcome again, Victor, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Mark. Red Green Revolution, the Politics and Technology of Eco-Socialism. Uh, the point, of course, is that this is a, a book that has a pretty clear thesis, and the thesis is about what I think we could say is the climate crisis, but other crises as well for right, the left. Right. Yes. Uh, would that be a fair representation that the crisis is pretty much right across the board? Yes, absolutely. I mean, because the environmental crisis is in part defined by the fact that we're living in a system that is dedicated to infinite expansion. That's the capitalist system. That's the essence of capitalism. It's grow or die as they say. So, uh, and as many people have said before me, you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. Well, that's yes, absolutely right. Yeah, and I suppose uh, we're seeing that, that when we, uh, forever, w when we turn on the news or hear the news or watch the news in some, on some device or other, right. it's, there's a climate crisis. There's floods, there's fires, there's all sorts of pestilence, as yeah. it were. And I would say that the environmental crisis is more than just the climate crisis, although that may be the central thing, but mm. the breakdown of biodiversity is the most general way of putting it, but the uh, depletion, uh, the extinctions of species, uh, depletion of raw materials, the uh, pollution of the air, and, and so on, all of these are uh, related to it. And just to uh, speak of headlines, I have to mention one that I heard just this morning, mm -hmm. which is that the Conference of Parties, the annual environmental summit, COP28, is going to have as its president a uh, representative of the Qatar oil industry. Can you imagine that? No, no, I'm sorry, I can't. It's going to, um, we're going to have to stop you right there yes. because my head's <laughs> going to explode. Yeah. Um, this is yeah. the perversions, the contradictions. Right. Are yeah. massive, aren't they? Yeah. I, I missed that bit of news, and I guess I've, now I've now we've got it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the idea of merging, as you do in this book, red and green, mm -hmm. uh, the sort of convergence, if you like and some critics might say conflation, yeah. I wouldn't, but the convergence of uh, red and green brings us to what is eco-socialism. And I'll just read this very brief definition that you have on page 30, which said, uh, the central point is one implied in the very definition of ecological socialism, namely that material needs would be satisfied without further taxing the environment. Within this framework, interrelated problems in a variety of areas would also be alleviated. So it's a pretty broad range of considerations. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I, it seems to me that what we've got to do is kind of work out how to meet the needs of the planet mm -hmm. as well as meeting the needs of the people, which you try to address in this book right. as part of the, the central challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Would you yep. like to comment more on that kind of challenge and how you try and work through those questions? Yeah, well, first of all, the domination of nature and the establishment of class society historically coincided. I mean, that was uh, the appropriation of private property uh, and the, the notion that one can do whatever one wants with what one owns is associated also with the establishment of domination over of some class of people over others. Um, but more generally now, in terms of the convergence of the two ideas of the red and the green, 
the point is that we can't satisfy human needs unless we have a healthy environment. I mean, if, if, if everything in the environment is destroyed, if biodiversity is destroyed, we can't live. So the idea that there's some kind of conflict between human needs and environmental requirements is a creation of, or a consequence, or a deduction from capitalist practice, which assumes that, that need is identifiable with infinite expansion. And that I s argue that that's a false conception of what need is, that, that uh, human need is something that can be satisfied in a way that doesn't destroy the natural environment, provided that the satisfaction of that need is organized in a, in a way that isn't exploitative and th that isn't built on profit-making, profit-earning, and, and so on, and infinite expansion. So, so that in other words, I'm looking for a, a, a restoration of a certain equilibrium between the satisfaction of human needs and the satisfaction of the requirements of various species um, in the natural environment. And of course, I recognize the difficulties of reestablishing something like that. And I recognize that in some ways it can't be completely restored in the sense that we have so many billions of people on the earth. And so that, that does in itself impose certain requirements. But the thing is that the way in which these, uh, this, these populations have been organized, and especially the priorities of the dominant groups have been so destructive that there has to be a radical change in the way people view their, their needs. I mean, so, so that we have to get away, on the one hand, from the consumer society, which I think is widely recognized, mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, from the, uh, the militarism, the expansionism, the imperialism, all these things are tied in because they're part of this uh, fabric of capitalist uh, organization and, and expansion. So these things are, I mean, they've long been recognized as being destructive to the interests of the majority of the people. If you take the world as a whole, you know, where it, it has brought impoverishment to vast regions of the world. But now in the last few decades, it's become clear that this is a threat not only to the, the world's majority population, but to the population as a whole in the sense that if the environment is destroyed, we cannot survive as a species. That's, that's clearly uh, the point of the crisis that seems to be growing greater and greater yeah. as the planet warms and as it's, it appears that there's really no significant change in human behavior, particularly when it comes to that issue that you address in part in a very strident way in the, in the book, and that is the total focus on consumption. Mm -hmm. that there I and, and the idea that people cannot consume at the level at which they're consuming uh, seems to just either go over people's heads or be really part of a very difficult message that no mm. one seems to be receiving. Right. So this, this, this goes to the sort of great challenge that I suppose has faced Marxism, is it not? Mm -hmm. That Marxism has said we need to have production so that people can have lived the good life, mm -hmm. as it were, mm -hmm. but we need to have production in such a way that it doesn't universally exploit people mm -hmm. and destroy them right. and destroy the planet. Right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it takes us, I, and the book I think takes us to the heart of some applied Marxism. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I, I find very, very, very uh, refreshing. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, other, the other point I wanted, wanted to talk about is this, uh, your commitment to and interest in democracy. And uh, here's another book that you've uh, put together. Uh, it's a collection of lectures, I believe, that you mm -hmm. gave in China a while ago. And it, has, it clearly has a focus on the idea of democracy, uh, the, the people, mm -hmm. and how the people might have uh, participation in the management of their lives. Uh, what What uh, is the future for democracy, given the crisis for the environment and the crisis for just sustainability of, of human life? Yeah, well, it ties in in a number of ways. I mean, because in the Red Green book, uh, the emphasis on democracy has to do with the 
whole question of how you make decisions on what to produce and how to produce and for whom and how much mm. for the society as a whole. And the, the argument is that if you are going to change the priorities of production, it has to be done uh, in the direction of a social control, a, a control that is democratic in the most basic sense based on informed participation of the totality of the population. Uh, and the, the, the failures of earlier attempts at socialism have been in part uh, traceable to the deficiencies in their developing this, this democratic aspect of the practice. The, you can't have proper planning unless everyone who's in, engaged in carrying the things out is participating in the process itself. The other way in which the democracy comes in is in the fact that as capitalism uh, continues its expansionist project and creates greater and greater uh, impoverishment and depletion, destruction of the environment, uh, it creates a greater and greater amount of discontent. And this discontent uh, under the circumstances, under the present circumstances of, of capitalist rule, uh, takes irrationalist forms. And, and this is, of course, one of the things capitalism encourages, that the, the same forces that uh, induce people to buy things they don't need <laughs> uh, also induces them to not see the importance of rational discussion mm -hmm. of the social problems and instead to scapegoat and create uh, movements of, of hatred and discrimination and xenophobia and so on, all the things that we experience that this is becoming increasingly strong as the ruling class is increasingly, increasingly incapable of satisfying popular needs. It resorts to these uh, devices, right? And of mm -hmm. course, it's, it's a complex manner in which this happens, but it comes out extremely, in an extremely striking way uh, in, the in the United States in, in the fact that they're actually seeking all kinds of ways to limit people's participation in the electoral process. Would that tend to suggest that we'll have to get to an even greater crisis in our understanding of democracy before we get closer to uh, the popular acceptance of something like socialism or an alternative system to what we've got now? Well, I, I think the, the crisis can't really be greater than it is now. It can just uh, intensify it. And, and mm. one mm. of the things about the environmental crisis is that every stage of it is more severe than was forecast at a certain stage by, uh, by people. But th there has to be a, a, a tremendous uh, amount of political education and reconsideration. And that's really what I'm trying to uh, suggest uh, ways of, of doing in, in, this, uh, in this discussion, that people, uh, there's a need for a kind of cultural transformation. Mm. Uh, the, the, and this, the kind of cultural transformation that's necessary to get away from the consumerism is, uh, involves the reconstruction, re reimagining of, of communities. And this is something that in order to be effective and to be uh, on the right track, has to engage uh, all the people. I mean, that, that it can't be imposed by someone mm. uh, from, from the top. It has to be engaged in by all the people. And so it's inherently a democratic process. And this hasn't even been uh, started, in a, in a sense, uh, on a society-wide level. Mm -hmm. There are little pockets where it, where it takes place. But uh, I mean, uh, one of the ways in which this is illustrated to me I is in the fact that the expressions or the manifestations of the environmental crisis, all these climate disasters and so on, they're just reported on. They, you sit back and watch them. You see them on television. But they're not made the subject of, of constant uh, organization of uh, community meetings and discussions and uh, educational programs and uh, reconsiderations of what to do. And, and one of the things I criticize also in the book is the fact that the response to that is cast to a very large extent in terms of looking for alternative means of generating energy, but no attention to the also vital task of reducing the total amount of energy that is going to be mm -hmm. required 
because uh, I mean I, I read about the you know the increasing electrification of cars as, as though you can have as long as you get them electrified uh, then that sort of takes care of the problem but in in fact of course all the materials that are used the mining that's required the space that's taken up uh, the uh, the absence of uh, space for bio restoring biodiversity this is something that can only be restored by transforming the communities and this involves everybody get engaging in the discussion and which is a, a democratic process in the most fundamental sense mm -hmm. which is not just a matter of uh, going and voting every once in a while but of being a, a fully engaged public participating in uh, designing policy and you know listening yeah. to all the in, uh, the necessary science and, and drawing the necessary conclusions and and acting on them and it's pretty clear in relation to that that there's such a, a dearth of real engagement in the way that government works I mean mm. representative government tends mm. to send people to a house mm -hmm. either in Washington DC if we like think of that large scale or in state capitals mm. and their representatives supposedly of the people but they tend to act immediately as representatives of the people who fund them yep. and right. the people who fund them of course are either themselves because the majority of people in Congress are millionaires or their corporations yeah right what are they going to do of course they just speak for the corporations and it, right. it, it's it doesn't seem to me to have any any much of a sniff of democracy about it as right, it happens. Right, right. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about about this because you mentioned things like worker control and have some comments about the union union movement or organised labour. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether organised labour is is something that again uh, at the present and in the immediate future may be where the solution lies. But mm -hmm. not organised labour in the tradition of of how it's often been constructed. Mm -hmm. For example, if I take one that I'm particularly interested in, police unions. Mm -hmm. Police unions have become, it seems to me, extremely conservative. Mm. All they do is look after themselves mm -hmm. and defend each other mm -hmm. and work for their pensions. Mm -hmm. But they're not really doing very much, and they're mm -hmm. often many communities, including this one we're in now in Newton, where we live, where I live is over-policed. Right, right. right. So th there's a real problem with the labour movement because there's that kind of end to it. And then there's the problem of, of so many labour unions and workers having no rights and no organisational capacity either. Mm -hmm. where, where, how, what do you have to suggest and where would a red-green movement yeah. make a contribution yeah. to that? Because it seems, or is it just the wrong thinking? No, well, I mean, it, obviously the working class is a vital part of the, uh, the society. I mean, the working class is the majority of the society, although most of it is not organized. But the way in which it's been organized, especially in the United States, is along the lines of what's called business unionism. That's what you yeah. describe. And as Kim Moody has written, there's a, the alternative is social movement unionism, uh, mo uh, unionism that is... Uh, imbued with a kind of consciousness of, of wider issues, uh, which has, uh, has been, uh, there is some tradition of that in the United States. Of course, the, the earliest expression of it was the industrial workers of the world, the mm. IWW, uh, which was rudely suppressed, of course, in the early 20th century. And uh, the unionism that actually emerged finally had, uh, there was a big, uh, an element of the social movement aspect in the 1930s, but it got, uh, in a way, bought off and so that element has to be revived. And there are, let's say, you might say there are rank and file caucuses, opposition movements within some of the unions which have more of a social consciousness. There's a, uh, an excellent uh, monthly newsletter I read called Labor Notes, which is an expression of this uh, trend within the union movement. Okay. And I think there is some re signs of revival of the union movement now. Uh, especially in the context of the failure to raise the federal minimum wage uh, for many, many years, and uh, the uh, polarization, the, the great increase in inequality, especially in the last few years with the, the COVID and the uh, eruption of you know, significant movements, like whether it's the Amazon workers or the Starbucks mm -hmm. workers or, or some of the teachers. And uh, the more this happens, uh, the, the more space there is for discussion of the wider issues, and that's what's what's necessary. Yeah. 
and the importance of, of media in being able in providing a, yeah. a, a space for that and to actually covering <laughs> yes <laughs> yes reporting on these things right. before our time runs out I want to I want to comment on and maybe we'll finish uh, the last few minutes on this and that is to talk about these f three wonderful chapters uh, at least from my point of view on technology particularly socialist technology mm -hmm. and the idea that a, a society can be organized around technology that uh, is directly connected or articulated with the environment, mm -hmm. with the needs of human beings, their real needs, mm -hmm. as opposed to the artificially created ones by mm -hmm. marketing and corporations, mm -hmm. and that technology also brings a more human capacity for us to be together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this idea of socialist technology is a very rich one, mm -hmm which of course we don't see much of because mm -hmm. we've mm -hmm. got these guys over in Silicon Valley who mm -hmm. make billions mm -hmm. by getting us all to think that we're individually very significant but of no value to much other to anybody else right. unless we're on you know some yeah. social media so right. the the idea of socialist technology very rich and a terrific tradition mm -hmm. do we do we need to have a deeper bigger critical conversation about that topic you think yeah well i mean the the idea is that technological decisions have to be arrived at democratically and have to be arrived at on the basis of uh, an attention to the natural environment. I mean, one of the spheres in which this is most obvious, and sometimes it's not even thought of as an issue of technology, mm. is, is agriculture. Because th this is one of the areas where the uh, capitalist agriculture has done so much to destroy the, the substructure, the deplete the aquifers, uh, poison the soil, uh, and, and so on, that uh, a socialist technology, the point about a socialist technology is that it, the decisions are made differently. The decisions are made democratically on the basis of informed understanding of the, of the basic issues. Uh, so it's not that there's a distinctive set of devices that's socialist or anything like that, but it's the system of relations within which technological decisions are arrived at. Oh, right. Yeah. Great. That's a great, a great, uh, a great sort of distinction, yeah. right, mm. between these sort of huge corporate organisations that come up with brilliant innovations and then just send them out to us, mm -hmm. right? Send them yeah. out to the population. Right. We have no participation in that largely. Right. We can turn on or off whether it's public or private. Right. Yeah, and and there's there's no consultation about setting up these. Um, Emi radiation emitters and that type of thing, that's a social issue that shouldn't just be imposed on us in the, in the same way that uh, certain types of processed food shouldn't be imposed on us, that, that, that the whole uh, processing of food is, is, a, is a, a scandal. And I mean, the, the decline of general public health, the increasing chronic diseases in the last few decades mm -hmm. is, is striking. And that's because the, the food industry is so much uh, controlled by the drive for profit making and to, to, to cheapen and to, if you, you can fill people up and, and uh, satisfy their immediate hunger uh, and never mind what it does to their health, mm. that's, that's the technology under the rule of capital. So technology outside of the rule of capital then can provide us with a, with a model, a potential model for how our social relations are enriched. Mm -hmm. and how we participate in decisions about them. Is that what you're right, saying? Right, right, mm -hmm. yes. Great. And, and where, where does this leave us uh, in terms of, uh, and this is cruel to ask you this in the last couple of minutes, but where does this leave the uh, community of the left in particular thinking about what the state of Marxism is now? Is there, is there a, should there be a change in how Marxism is thought about? Well, I think there has already been a lot of evolution, and I would... Mar uh, emphasize that uh, Marxism has witnessed a revival in the last uh, couple of decades, really. Is it, yeah. And uh, that's what uh, this, this other book of mine mm. called uh, Socialist Practice is part of a, a series of Marx and Marxisms uh, that was started in the last few years and, and that uh, is really uh, shows the wide range of, of applicability of, of Marxist analysis in all kinds of areas. Um, and uh, so, so I, I would say that the development of capitalism in the last few years has really dramatized more than ever the relevance of Marxism because for a while uh, people could argue well Marxism was uh, is, is dead now because the first attempt at socialism collapsed but all the problems that occasioned that original uh, set of socialist revolutions they they exist tenfold hundredfold mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. 
mm. uh, and the mere fact that the, a, s a particular set of revolutions was defeated or distorted or, or undone doesn't mean that the problems they arose to confront have disappeared. They still exist, and the, the inequalities have, have increased even more greatly, and the, the attempts to alleviate or humanize or put a human face on capitalism have been have been undone gradually, and uh, gradually, or in some cases suddenly, by uh, by military coups or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the the problems are uh, as sharp and as urgent as ever, and e even more so. And so there's, uh, I think, in that sense, we witness in this country even an openness to ideas of socialism in the last few years, even shown in public opinion polls, that despite all the propaganda against it for many, many decades, that, uh, that, that people realize that, that capitalism doesn't work. And I think this has been quite apparent since 2008 and 9, that meltdown, that, uh, that young people are aware that, that capitalism I is not viable and we have to look somewhere else. And it was particularly noticeable then when Bernie Sanders was really mm -hmm. ascendant and the number of people, young people especially, mm -hmm. who were mm -hmm. saying, well, they were supportive of mm -hmm. not only Bernie, but mm -hmm. of the idea of socialism, mm -hmm. the idea of collective welfare, mm -hmm. the idea of you know, also fairly simple ideas like having universal health care and not having massive debt when they graduate from college. Right. So, Victor, look, thank you very much for uh, being here and for this uh, conversation and particularly uh, for this book I think it's provocative and it's really valuable yeah. uh, as Thank I you. say particularly I'm particularly uh, excited about the uh, socialist technology aspects of it the idea that we can have another way of thinking about how our lives are so deeply incorporated into technology and then to be able to think about what that what the alternatives are mm -hmm. uh, probably quite important and helpful for uh, some academics, but also people working in the technology sector. Mm -hmm. uh, that that certainly could be useful. Uh, any last thoughts? Well, yeah, it's uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, to talk with you, and I, I I can't emphasize enough the importance of everyone getting involved in this. It's not something that can be solved by some politicians that one puts up there or votes for. That it's it's ne necessary to have popular organizations in which the the people themselves are organized as the working class is organized and and is uh, articulating I its own interests and in the effort to do so recognizes that it has to be fully informed and especially of the uh, of the emergency that's posed by the environmental crisis and of course this doesn't exclude the emergency of war danger no. of war I mean that's right. part of it that adds to the crisis the military is one of the biggest uh, destroyers of the environment uh, there is and, can, and uh, it, we, you fight all these wa wars for oil mm. and and and, uh, and use up a lot of uh, oil and burn a lot of the, the things in, in the process of doing so so uh, so but the alternative it will not be created unless everyone gets involved and it's it, it's a matter of uh, of life and death and I, I think it's this is becoming increasingly clear that casualties of the present system are dramatic and it's just that people don't uh, see them as systemic they, they see them as as, uh, mm. as incidents that you see you look at on the on the television but you don't analyze the underlying basis or the uh, kinds of relations that would be necessary in order to uh, find different ways of, of doing things, to set different priorities. Well, let's set out priorities. Thank you so much, Victor, uh, for your comments and for your book or books and uh, for inspiring us and thinking, helping us to think through what we can do, not only locally, but then collectively yeah. to uh, engage in this struggle. So that's all from us, from me, from Boston Media Theory. Thank you very much. And until next time, see you later and keep mediating. <laughs>